Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Dora. I'm one of the organizers of Cash Share, and the other is Sebastian. You can see us both uh, here under the name Cash Share. We started this project uh, in order to introduce Jewish communities from all over the world in our normal uh, regular sessions, we usually look at a different city or a different country and its Jewish history, Jewish heritage, and uh, and present day situation. Uh, today's talk is a little bit different. Uh, it's uh, it's going to focus not on a full city or a full country, but only a very specific community. Uh, we are very happy to welcome Nachshon Rodriguez Pereira, who has given us many, many talks about the Jewish heritage of Amsterdam in general. Uh, and we invited to speak about his own, in, own initiative, which is the Bendigamos community that he's the founder and the leader of. So today you can find out about this uh, amazing Jewish community in Amsterdam. I'll just pass the word to Nachshon. He will explain everything else. The talk will be around 40, 45 minutes. And then after we will open it up for Q&A. So if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and we will try to answer as many questions as, as we have time for. So Nachshon, the, the floor is all yours and please share with us about the Bendigamos community. Thank you, Dora. And hello everyone. Good evening from Amsterdam. Good to see you. I see some of you on video. That's Beautiful, and I even see some familiar faces, some Dutch faces. Hi, nice to see all of you. Um, we're gonna have some some good times tonight. I'm just gonna share my presentation with you right away, and we'll get started. And I'll tell you tonight a little bit about the secrets of our Benny Gamos community, and it's as I wrote here, an exciting answer to a landscape full of challenges. And um, I think you're gonna be. Yeah, um, I mean, I'm really um, passionate about uh, about this project. I'm really looking forward to tell you about it, not just because I think it's a nice project to hear about, but also because I think that this is something that a lot of Jewish communities in the world may also benefit from from our experiences. So let's uh, let's start this adventure. And it starts with a little introduction. Um, I see that there's a picture that didn't for some reason is not loading, but um, my name is Nachshon Rodriguez Pereira. Hi, I'm uh, 38 years old, and I'm one of the few Portuguese Jewish uh, Jews left in the in the Netherlands. Um, I'm married to Alumit. You see us here um, together with our son Eli. I have a master's in political science, um, and I started my Jewish career as a Chazan actually already when I was 13 years old. And only a few weeks back, I celebrated that I was a Torah reader for 25 years, which is uh, really incredible. Um, and for 12 years, I was the chazan, the cantor and the educator at the Esnoga, the Portuguese synagogue in Amsterdam. And in 2015, I became the leader of Bendy Gables that we'll be talking about tonight. Um, if you see the kind of things I'm, I have done and I'm doing, you can see I'm a, I'm a guy with a lot of energy. <laughs> I do a lot of stuff. Um, even just right now, I'm working for Bet Shalom, the Jewish retirement home, where I'm in charge of the Jewish identity there. I'm a city councillor. I'm a Jewish educator. I organize Jewish uh, concerts, for example, this Hanukkah in the big Amsterdam concert hall, and lots of other stuff. So it gives you a bit of an idea of what, um, what I'm doing. Um, why are we doing this tonight? So first of all, just in general, I'm always happy to tell about what we're doing at Bendigamos. It's very exciting, and I think that um, yeah, a lot of other communities can uh, can benefit from it. Um, also, special about Benig about Benigamos is that we have the Portuguese Jewish tradition and heritage, um, which is I think something that um, a lot of people should should know about, or maybe they know about it and they want to know more. And uh, we're in Amsterdam, and Amsterdam is right now very hot. It's very much in the news, um, unfortunately not for good reasons, but it does. Um, yeah, it does mean that a lot of people want to know like what's going on, how are things going there. So I thought it would would be a good time also to, um, yeah, to to give a talk about Jewish Amsterdam. And if you like, in the questions afterwards, I can also share a bit about those challenges that we're facing. Um, and I, I I mentioned that you know 
Uh, I think Benny Gamos has some beautiful aspects that other people could learn it from. But on the other hand, I also think that, you know, we have a great group of people here and we can also learn from, from other, like, I'm also happy to learn from other people. I think just for us to have a global community, we know of each other, where we are from, what we do. I think we can learn a lot from each other. And I think uh, we need that. We need to strengthen the Jewish voice all over the world. So I think it's just nice to be in contact and uh, to be in touch and to know from each other. Oh, we're going to listen to something, <laughs> to a song. We're starting my origin story to tell you a bit about um, where I came from. And then I'll show you, I'll tell you a bit about how Benigamo started, what our goal is, what our challenges were, how we were able to make this a success. I'll tell you our secrets. And then I'll tell you about a very exciting new project that we just started. Um, and then we'll go to the to the questions. But first, we're going to listen for about one minute to a song which was recorded in 1960, 64 years ago. Um, at the, This was a wedding of the uncle of my grandfather in the Portuguese synagogue. And um, yeah, it just uh, gives you a feeling of where I, where I come from and how I grew up. Um, but what for me maybe... Uh, is the is the best example of when when I think of my Jewish heritage, what I what I think of first, what what kind of uh, sound goes with it. Here we go. This is um, Baruch Haba. I'm sure some of you have recognized it. Um, welcome, welcome. It means um, also welcome to you, to our to our beautiful heritage. This was not a choir. These were just the congregants singing one of their uh, signature songs from the from the festivals and from the chupa, from the wedding. Um, Fifteen years after the end of the Second World War, and um, basically what you see here on the right, the Portuguese synagogue filled with people together with the singing together, sharing our identity and values and giving this from one generation to the next. That's basically what, what I want, what I want most. That's, that's what, that's what drives me. Um, and the Portuguese synagogue on a regular Saturday morning, um, when I, when I came there, when I was 16, when I started leading services there, we were 10, 15 members. Um, at some point we went up to 50. Um, and when I left, it uh, when it came down again to like 10, 10 15 members, something like that uh, a week. And um, what I want for it is it, for it to be full. That's what I want. And uh, unfortunately, in the Second World War, 90%, 90% of the community was killed. And um, yeah, we're still basically struggling to, to deal with that and to rise again. So, um, but this is... If you see, if you look at the picture at the left, this is me when I was two years old, already pretending to be a chazan, pretending to be a cantor. Um, I will, I'm not wearing a talit. I think I stole or took uh, my mom's skirt and used it as a talit and just already pretended to be a chazan. I was literally two years old. So you can see from a young age, I wanted to be uh, a cantor. And also at a young age, I went to Portuguese synagogue. I saw the people singing together. I saw the candles, candle light, and everything. And I just knew like this is this is what I want, and this is where I am most happy. And yeah, when I saw how on a regular on a regular Shabbat there are so few people, I just wanted to to yeah to put my energy into uh, into make bringing this back, building this back. Um, and how did we end up here? And when I say we, I mean the Jews. Why are the Jews in Amsterdam at all? Just a little uh, summary. Um, 
actually, let me sh first show you this. I have a, a short video for you where you can, ex where in just one minute, it ex it's explained how the Jews ended up in Amsterdam. Here we go. Oh, it's the other button. Hoi, ik ben Nachson. Welkom in de Portugese synagoge, kortweg Snoge genoemd. De Snoge is gebouwd voor Joden die ooit uit Spanje en Portugal naar Amsterdam kwamen. Iedere week leid ik hier de diensten en geef ik les aan Joodse jongeren. Maar wat is Joods? En wat deden die Joden uit Spanje en Portugal eigenlijk in Amsterdam? Kijk, al die mensen op dit schilderij zijn net als ik Joods. Zo'n 3000 jaar geleden woonden onze voorouders aan de oostoever van de Middellandse Zee. Ze daalden wegens hun hongersnood af naar Egypte, waar ze als slaven gevangen gehouden werden. Mozes, geboren als kind van slaven en opgegroeid aan het Egyptische hof, bevrijdde zijn volk en leidde het naar de woestijn. Daar krijgt Mozes van God de Torah, het eerste deel van de Hebreeuwse Bijbel, met de tien geboden. En hij wijst het Joodse volk de weg naar het beloofde land. In Jeruzalem bouwen ze de tempel, een heiligdom voor God en zijn geboden. Maar in het jaar 70 verwoesten de Romeinen de tempel en verdrijven zij de Joden uit het land. Vanaf dat moment verspreiden Joden zich over de hele wereld. Waar ze ook wonen, ze houden zich aan de leefregels van de Torah en komen samen in synagoge. Zo leefden Joden ook eeuwenlang in moslim Spanje. Nadat katholieke koningen daar de macht overnemen, moeten Joden zich bekeren. Wie weigert, kon levend verbrand worden. In 1492 worden alle Joden uit Spanje verdreven. Vele vluchten naar Portugal, waar ze alsnog gedwongen worden gedoopt. Maar ook daar zijn ze als bekeerlingen hun leven niet zeker. Ze vluchten opnieuw, op zoek naar vrijheid. Rond 1600, het begin van de Gouden Eeuw, komen deze bekeerde Joden in Amsterdam aan. Het stadsbestuur van Amsterdam is geïnteresseerd in deze nieuwkomers. Het zijn kooplieden met internationale contacten. Ze mogen blijven. Hier kunnen ze weer als Joden leven. Alleen, hoe doe je dat ook alweer? Er komt een rabbijn naar Amsterdam om hen te helpen. Hij leert in Hebreeuws, de taal van de Torah, en al snel vindt in zijn huis de eerste Joodse gebedsdiensten plaats. Zeventig jaar later zou hier de grote Portugese synagoge gebouwd worden. Yes, so um, that's how we ended up here. And um, this is the wrong button. Hoi, hoi, ik. Uh, it didn't go exactly as planned, sorry. Here we go. Okay, so um, this is basically what I, what I, this, um, yeah, what I told you earlier. Um, after the Spanish Inquisition, we came to Amsterdam, and actually, Amsterdam was for a long time the center of the Jewish world. We had the most Jews, we had most freedom of all the Jews in the world. We had uh, the best rabbis, the best schools, really large infrastructure. Um, and the Esnoga was the biggest synagogue in the world for 200 years. So this is what, um, where, we, where we started. And then the Second World War happened and 90% of the synagogue and 80% of the Dutch Jews were killed. Um, and we are still dealing with the effects of what happened then. Um, as I mentioned, 85% of the Jews right now in the Netherlands are unaffiliated. We have an 85% intermarriage rate. And as you know from the news, we are also dealing with uh, some anti-Semitism, some rising of anti-Semitism. So we have quite some challenges here, um, similar, I think, to many other communities, although the numbers in the Netherlands, if you look at the Second World War, are um, the, one of the highest together with Poland. But unaffiliation and intermarriage, of course, is something, and uh, rising anti-Semitism is something that you see Unfortunately, most parts uh, of the world. So that's something we have to have to deal with. Um, Hoi, ik ben Nachson. I don't know why I can go past it, but I'll just put it like this. Yes. So what does post-war Amsterdam look like? Um, about 10% of the community survived. And even though they were here, they were not really here because... There is a lot of trauma, a lot of pain in the community. And of course, this trauma affects everyone. It affects the atmosphere. Um, and that in turn affects the ability to attract the young generation um, because of the atmosphere or because you know there's a lot of tension, because there's not a mindset, an open 
fresh mindset where you can really look to the future because you're still dealing with the past. And because of this, the beautiful, rich heritage that we have, the traditions, the music, the culture, the community life is on the verge of disappearing. And also the general Jewish infrastructure is under pressure in the Netherlands. Um, so this is the story, not just about the Portuguese synagogue, but basically the whole Jewish life is dealing with this. Um, to give you an idea, we have about 50,000 Jews in the Netherlands right now. Um, about 15 to 20,000 of them are Israeli Jews. Just over half of them, of all the Jews, live in or around Amsterdam. And as I said, 85% is unaffiliated. So the actual community, the people that you will see more, more or less now and then, uh, at whatever, is about 7,500 people. Um, at the same time, we do have a beautiful infrastructure still. We have some kosher restaurants. We have two Jewish schools. We have some rabbis, some synagogues. Um, it's nice, but if you look at the bigger picture, um, we are below the, the critical mass. And um, I mean, you, if you look at the numbers, 85% un unaffiliated, 85% in, in a marriage, we're just going to shrink. Our, our community will will um, will just go down if we don't do anything soon. So that's why in 2015, we said it's time for something new. Um, what do we need? And it's something that I think people need all over the world in, in many Jewish communities. We need joyful, positive Judaism that's healthy, warm, and welcoming. Um, also, we we need to proactively bring people in and making them feel at home because there's a lot of people for who feel a certain uh, a bar or um, let's say uh, they feel... Um, yeah, I'm looking for word in English, sorry. It's just not so easy for them to cross the, you know, go into inside a place where they don't feel comfortable and need to, you, they need to be helped a little bit. Um, and to invest in the younger generations, um, we need education um, and commitment through inspiration. Um, I'll tell a bit more about what I mean here. And so we, we just uh, started with, yeah, something which has these eight things or these six things as a um, as a center of what we do: personal attention, um, living live and let live, positive energy, high accessibility, looking out for each other, and it takes a community to raise a child. These are all things that I'm I'm going to tell a bit more about, but these are some topics that I felt were missing in most of our synagogues. Let's say actually all of our synagogues. If you look at personal attention, most synagogues would say, you know, we're here. You should sort of be happy. That we're here, you know, we're established, we're old, we're special. So you, you know, you should be happy that we are, you know, that, that you can come to us, live and then live. I'm speaking about uh, judging, judgmental uh, people, where people will be judged on um, how Jewish they were, or what they look like, or how much money they have, or uh, how religious they were. So a lot of judgment, which is not a good way to, you know, bring new people in. Um, positive energy. Of course, which is logical, the the war and the trauma would take uh, would have a large influence on the atmosphere and how people would behave. Um, high accessibility, um, synagogue services, and I'm speaking in the Netherlands. Most of the synagogues are Orthodox. Um, the synagogues are, of course, in Hebrew, which is, I mean, makes sense. They are two and a half hours long. That in itself is not an issue, but if you go to a synagogue and no one explains anything and they just sort of expect for you to just you know survive or, or figure it out yourself that's not really uh it's not really working so we wanna we were looking for a synagogue where people would find it more easy to to feel at home also with the, all the customs looking out for each other um if you don't have those, those first four things then people um will, will find it will feel themselves a bit lost in such a community and why do you go to community? Because you know, because you're you're a community. Because you look out for each other. And if you're not offering that, then you're 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 just not providing people what they're looking for. And it takes the community to raise a child. What we see is that basically everyone of my age, a little older, and everyone younger, they they don't really feel connected to a community. And because of this, um, they they just drop out. The eighty five percent unaffiliation rate. Is a result of them not feeling connected to uh, to the community. So those were again the issues, but also sort of how we wanted to work um, how, to, how to find a solution to do the exact opposite of what we were experiencing. So we started 
something new, the birth of Benny Gamos, which was really exciting. We started in June 2015. When I say we, um, it's basically me and I invited some some of my friends um, in June 2015. And I was, as I said, the, the cantor at the Portuguese synagogue for 12 years. And in those 12 years, there were two reasons for me, main reasons why I, I wanted to go somewhere else. One is I'm living here in the south of Amsterdam, the suburb of Amsterdam, where most of the Jews lived. Most of the Jews, they moved out of the center of Amsterdam. So it was difficult to to attract and to reach every all the people that we needed to reach. And secondly, as I said, the, there was still the post-war mentality and it was really difficult to, to really get the... The organization to to um, to facilitate to what the younger generations needed, and as I told you before, I want to have a future for you know for my children for the next generation, and if we don't act now, we're just not gonna have a future. Um, so that's why I decided to start something new. Um, and we started our first service at fifty people. We just rented a place in this in this area in the Jewish area. We started with Shabbat morning service every two weeks plus one event a month, something fun. Um, and our goals were just to make sure that we have a future and to maintain our beautiful tradition and our heritage. And sort of the second goal was to grow back the community. And when I say the community, of course, it's a Jew Portuguese Jewish community, but really it's the Jewish community at large because the Jewish community at large is at stake in, in Amsterdam and the Netherlands. And our average attendance went up pretty quickly. The first half year, we were 35 people on average. And after a year and a half, our average was already 60 people, which is really a lot in Amsterdam, considering only 400 people on average go to shul on Shabbat morning in the city. And we are an outreach synagogue. So we, wanna, we want to um, get the unaffiliated ones to come to us. So this was, I think, uh, was pretty cool. And first, what are some things that we have achieved in those first few years, uh, we were able to grow to an average of 80 to 100 attendants for Shabbat morning already at, after a couple of years. We have 200 friends. We call them amigos or amigas that pay a monthly contribution. Um, we have 50 events in, per year right now. So it means one one a month, uh, one a week on average. And we work together with many Jewish organizations, really all, really all kinds of Jewish organizations. Whereas before there was a lot of politics, right now we just, whatever strengthens the Jewish life, whatever makes more life means that we should uh, we should do it. Um, we have a lot of smachot, a lot of um, celebrations that we have each year. We have a lot of bar and bat mitzvahs. We have chuppot, we have births, which is really uh, important to, to have that in your community. Um, and for example, uh, bar mitzvah kids that also come back a year later to again, celebrate our birthday, read from the, from the Torah. Like these are things that we that we put extra attention uh, on. Uh, we do education. So we teach the Bar and Bat Mitzvah kids. We teach people to learn the Chazanut, which is how to lead services. We give lectures. We have children's services. Um, we get over a thousand unique visitors a year, which is, I think, really exciting for the services. And then another thousand, there are some overlap for other events that we do. Also, something that's really exciting is that we are now affiliated with the Spanish and Portuguese Beit Din, the Rabbinical Court of London. What this means is, um, if you want to have access to the Jewish infrastructure, um, you need to have some sort of proof that you're Jewish. And a rabbi has to do that. Now, in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam, you have basically two options, and those options are very expensive and many people the experience their experience is um generally not so great like they they don't feel um they're all treat like treated in such a kind way i mean not everyone thinks like that but still 85 percent on affiliation rate has to do with how people perceive the way they are being treated as customers they a lot of people will not say it's customer friendly and so one of the ways to bring people in and to not just give them a place where they can go for an event or a service, but to really provide them access to the Jewish infrastructure, we needed to do something different. And we were able to, to do this officially, to become an affiliate of the for London Bedin, which is really 
um, revolutionary because in the Netherlands, I don't think it has ever happened that it, that it was allowed even by the revenants of the city to um, to have a bed dean from abroad. So this is um, this is really cool and spectacular, and I'm sure this is pretty new. We're gonna have a lot of more people that will because of this become affiliates. That's one of, one of our plans. And I would say the biggest success is that many, many, many people have found or found again their joy in Judaism and being part of a Jewish community and became more active. So I think joy is really important for them to enjoy being in a Jewish environment, to enjoy learning, enjoy celebrating Shabbat together or just, yeah, just being part of a Jewish community. So we have we have so many people that when they come to us, they, um, they felt a distance distance to the community they felt judged they had bad experiences um they felt hurt and here we can provide them you know healing and, and a positive alternative and this is one of the most rewarding things i think of uh, what of we've been doing um oh here's a, a little um this is a, an israeli student who was here with us only for a few months and she says in a few lines how she uh, how she felt um and this is for people who were only just here for a few this few is weeks. To me because it gave me a place where I always felt welcome. Me and every other Jew always accepted with open hands and warm heart. It was a place that let me connect very deeply in both to the writers and to the community like I've never felt it before. So this is uh, we get um every year dozens of people that feel like this. They feel connected, they feel welcome, they feel um, inspired and that's that's really what we're um what we're doing um we also work with a lot of volunteers because everything we do is volunteer work also for me this is what i do as a hobby on the side um we have several dozens of uh, volunteers we have committees that are, organize events uh, for the kiddush for children's services for students and young professionals a building committee we have a general committee um and it works really well we have so many people that are are happy to invest time into creating something bigger and we and they see of course that it's working um one of the cons though is that if you work with uh, solely volunteers that you can not expect as much as from a paid person so sometimes you have to wait longer for things to, to happen that's just uh so i think one or two professional people will be nice but human capital is really one of our most important things we can do incredible things um with uh, like five percent of the budget of other synagogues and we have 50 events a year which is i think more than all the synagogues combined in amsterdam um and how we do it we get the income that we do have from our members that we call friends and subsidies and donations and that's how we can break even so we're i mean we're we're doing well this way now a little bit about the secrets are you ready these are the secrets um and i hope these are are helpful also to other communities so the first one Actually, I started thinking about our secrets and I thought maybe there's like two or three. And I I started thinking and I thought maybe we have like 15 or 20 secrets, but I, I tried to give it to this. And I think the real secret is that we have all of this together. Um, but yeah, an important one is community first, no politics. Um, I think everyone who puts their own interest up, uh, above the community should not um, should not have a place in a healthy community. Um, we have seen it a lot in the Jewish world, I think all over the world, um, that ego is important. People are doing it also for their own, um, you know, for an honor, or people are um, elected into some sort of board because they are available, but not necessarily because they are capable. So we are really strict with this. Um, if we notice that people are um, putting the interests of the of themselves above the community who we'll have a serious talk with them. We're very clear about the vision and what we want. And if people are are putting their interests above the community, then we'll have a discussion with them and uh, we'll yeah we'll work it out in a way that uh, either they change or they'll they'll do something else because we we cannot we cannot uh, afford to to have. <laughs> politics in our communities it's really making it's really bringing so much down and at the same time education is really important um every community needs education to survive and that's why we put a lot of effort into educating people in any any kinds of way one of the things i want to mention is um that we have courses on how the services go 
how to follow the service, how to sing along. Um, and for example, we do that for the holidays for Yom Kippur. We know um, people love Yom Kippur, but they usually go for an hour, maybe two hours, and they don't really know how to follow the service. So what we do is every year we offer one or two free lunches, free lunches, and we get 30, 40, 50 people um, that come. And during those lunches for an hour and a half, we explain them how to follow the service and how to read along the service, how to sing along the services. And this makes such a big, big change because it brings them to the synagogue during the year. It, it's a nice event, the lunch. And during Yom Kippur, they feel more inspired. It makes the service better, which makes other people more inspired for about the service. And often, because they feel more comfortable during Yom Kippur, they are also more prone to visiting us during other uh, days. So we see that things like this, helping people through education, making them feel more comfortable and more knowledgeable, that it's a, a really good um, way to bring people into your community. So this is definitely a secret, something that works. Um, this seems, this may be uh, an easy, like, uh, like um, I don't know how to say it, but like something that you would expect, but to have high quality of events and high quality of communication, it, it seems logical, but I've seen a lot of communities where it's very different. We want to make sure that everything that we do, everything has a high quality. It means that the atmosphere is good. It means that, um, you know, you think about things in advance, you make sure, um, like if there's a, an important like a, a different service that you don't figure it out at the moment itself but you prepare it um there's a party you make sure that you know the the, the food and the music and everything should just be in order and also the communication if it's it has to be friendly it has to be customer friendly it has to be um you know of a good level and we can see that it makes a lot of difference i would say maybe half of the people <laughs> in our community are are they're in pain from the way people they've been treated just in in emails or in phone calls or just in the, the daily conversation so it's just really important to put extra effort into it and the 80 20 maybe you know it from the from the business world or the marketing world um it doesn't have to be perfect with um 20 percent of your efforts you can get 80 percent of the results so if you go for an eight out of ten that's already good it doesn't have to be perfect but you do have to you have to work work on it um, and it's worth the time. Now, the fifth uh, or number five, Secrets of Bendigamos, um, implementing the Jewish Identity Wheel 5. In the in the Netherlands, we have a scientist called Ido Abram, and he developed something called the Wheel 5, the Jewish Identity Wheel 5. And basically it says that every Jew um, could have like some sort, I, I call it a pizza. Let's say every Jew... His Jewish identity is a pizza with five different toppings. And through these toppings, he or she connects through to Judaism. And one of the topics is religion. Okay. Um, then one of them is Israel. One of them is the, you know, the, the stories of our ancestors, especially the persecution part. But the others are just being part, you know, of something that's generations long, the 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 connection through family, through all the generations. And the fifth one is culture. And if you ask this 15, 16 million Jews in the world to draw their pizza, to make their pizza, every pizza looks different. Every pizza looks different. However, in the Orthodox synagogues in the Netherlands, um, it, the most important uh, pizza topping that's being served is religion. 90% of all the pizza that's being served, of all the efforts, all the events that are being are organized, are just that topping. And even if you like, so unless you really like the topping, you're not gonna have such a good time there. You're not gonna have your your um your satisfaction. And even if you do like that topping a little bit or you want to get to know it, if it's just that, it's not gonna be a great meal. You know, um if you like uh if you don't like broccoli so much, but you get it, you no, know, if you have a nice meal and there is some broccoli on your plate, you may eat it and you may start to like it. But if it's just broccoli, maybe that's a bit too much. So our community, that's really one of our secrets, is we try to um, to offer something for all the pizzas and to provide all the toppings so that everyone can uh, feel like there's something for them. And there's a lot of people in other synagogues that, we, that they feel like, I, you know, they feel 
they shouldn't go to synagogue because, you know, they're not so religious or they don't believe or whatever reasons they have. And we want to make sure that they feel that they're they're welcome, that there's, there's a place for every Jew in the Jewish community. So we are not just the Jewish religion, we're the Jewish people. That's basically what we're saying. And we, we're not just saying it, but we're doing it also through helping them connect through uh, Judaism, through different topics. Um, then four, innovating uh, and adjustments um, while staying true to your values. I, I think there's a lot of trends in the world and you can, of course, uh, always look, go after the trends and, and change. But if you change yourself and you change, you know, you start being authentic, it's not going to work either. But within those changes, it's um, or within being yourself, it's important to come up with new things every time see like if there's something new that can bring people in. Um, for example, something we did was we had a table tennis tournament for our sixth anniversary in the synagogue on Shabbat morning. We had the service, we had a kiddush, and afterwards we we brought in seven table tennis tables and two professionals, and we had over 100 people playing table tennis there in a tournament. Nothing completely unheard of in an ortho, like in a synagogue or in an orthodox uh, environment. But it works. But and we did it the year afterwards again. But the third year we did something else because you have to you don't have, you shouldn't do, do the same things all the time, but it, it worked really well. Um the, the second secret, for some reason the picture is not loading, the tapas theory. Um and entry points. I, I I see that we're running out of time already. So I'm gonna I see there are I'm, I'm gonna wrap it up a little bit, but I'll tell you about this theory. Um but what I how I think. Judaism works, how we can grow Judaism. This is a theory I think can work for everyone. Let's say that the Jewish life, if you want to measure how the Jewish life is growing, is basically the consumption of Jewish events, Jewish stuff. And how do you measure that? Let's say everything you can do in Judaism, go to synagogue, go to a Jewish school, go to a Jewish concert, but also, you know, go to uh, hear, the, listen to the show for a Hoshana, to go to the Seder on Pesach. Let's say these are all little tapas, little bites. And um, a lot of people may may like some of those bites, may not like some of those bites. If you go to a synagogue where people expect you to eat all of those tapas at a certain time, in a certain way, and you have to have the appetite, and otherwise you, you, you don't fit in, that's not really going to help people to develop their taste. So what we try to do is we try to offer a plate with all these different tapas in a very... Uh, you know, friendly way. And we say, look, here we have this beautiful plate with all kinds of nice uh, things. You know what? Just try one. Try this one, try that one. And whatever you like, you will have more of that and it's all fine. There's no pressure. There's no judgment. And because of this, people will be able to at least develop their taste and they'll eat whatever they like. And because of that, more Jew Judaism is being consumed. And this is the way we, we look at um, bringing people closer to Judaism and it's working really well. So it's a tapas theory. And basically, baby steps, um, easy access is part of that, that we say, you know what, it's okay if you just do one thing or two things. If you come once a year, it doesn't matter. You're all, Everyone is as much part um, of the community. And it's important that to, to remind people of that. And I think the most important thing is personal attention. Um, people, you can make flyers and you can make email newsletters and whatever. But the best thing is for people to have a personal connection, to have, basically, if you have a larger crowd, maybe have someone in charge of the students and someone in charge of the expats and someone in charge of the families, whatever, and make sure that all of them get personal messages on a reg sort of regular basis. When it's their birthday, when it's their yard site, um, invite them for events that you think are interesting to them. I think that's really important. And also we use the loyalty letter, um, but I may talk about it later just look up on google loyalty letter <laughs> and um it's important to um ask people for engagement that's also fitting to where they are at your loyalty letter basically and um, what we see with a lot of synagogues they are asking to be from people to become members when they're not yet connected enough so we give everyone time to just you know grow into the community and um so maybe a lot of these things sound sort of logical but if you have all of this in your community, I know a lot of communities don't have all of these things, and it's really not that much work. 
um, you can start from scratch. <laughs> we started from scratch nine years ago, and this is where we are now. So I think that's um, it's really something a lot of people can can benefit from. So these are just the secrets that we discussed. Um, and the main thing, if you summarize it, it's to put the community first, put the people first, while still remain authentic. That's that's the key thing. Um, now we re we reached a plateau because we were um, we were renting. We're still renting a room um, that we couldn't always use, and it's you know uh, we have to set it up every time and break it down every time. Um, we grew really much. Like Yom Kippur, the first one we had, we had fifty people, and two years ago we had two hundred fifty. So we just need to expand, and that's why we had a solution, which is to to build or to buy our own place where we can be twenty four seven and grow further. And after searching for many many years, we found something and acquired it. I'm just going to show you the pictures and then we'll go to the question and answers. Here are some, by the way, some events, some pictures that you can see what we, we, we do. A lot of young people, parties, barbecues, shabbatons. Um, and uh, here's the table tennis thing and the sushi workshop. Um, this is a non-violent communication thing, a center with uh, more than 100 people, laser tag. Uh, we do a lot of different things. So we um, we bought this house, which is going to become, if everything goes well, a Jewish student home. And we got this center in the middle of the Jewish area, which is going to be used as um, a synagogue. And here is a social space. This is also a student house right now. And already this room is being used for um, student meals, for challah bags, for um, student study spaces, actually, even. Um, and this is going to be renovated into a big event hall for parties and for lectures and for concerts. And this part is going to be our synagogue. So it's uh, pretty exciting. You see, there's um, this is a little bit of what it's going to look like eventually. And um, yeah, it's really, <laughs> really exciting. Um, our dreams and ambitions are to complete the renovation, of course, and then add programming and professionalized organization. Um, and we expect that we can start reaching um, about 10,000 people with the new building instead of the 2,000 that we reach now. Um, and the conclusion um, is that I think Jewish Amsterdam has a lot of potential. We've only started to scratch the surface of that. We're working hard to make the most of this. Um, Benigamos has created an atmosphere and an infrastructure where we can guide and activate and retain thousands of Jews. And we have many challenges that are similar to those in other Jewish communities. And so I call up everyone to learn from each other together, to work together and strengthen the Jewish people worldwide. worldwide. And I really hope that, uh, yeah, maybe you'll visit us in Amsterdam and that you'll be a witness of seeing how Amsterdam will really revive and um, yeah, go back um, to raise up from his ashes and we'll have a Jewish community even stronger than before a second world war. So for now, I wanna really thank you for listening to our story. As you can see, <laughs> I can talk about this uh, passionately for hours. There's a lot to be sh shared and told. And I didn't even tell you much about our, our heritage itself, etc. cetera. But um, somewhere this week, you're gonna receive a nice PDF with links with uh, recordings and music and other interesting articles where you can uh, see more about what we're doing and how to follow us. I'm really happy to open the floor for questions. I just want to show you some um, some video footage to give you a, a feeling of what our atmosphere is like. And then I'm really happy to uh, to get all your questions. This is our new building. So my name is uh, Dan. I've been involved uh, in the task force of Bendikaas for a couple of years. Now that I'm here, it's just amazing. It's a community center for everyone to be a part of Judaism in Holland. Elke keer als je hier komt, voelt het echt gewoon als een familie. Je wordt altijd heel verwelkomd hier. I've tried different synagogues and uh, shuls, but for me, Bendikaas until now is where I fit the best. It's just, it, it feels like family. Bendikaas is a hele verwelkomende poort naar het, het grotere Joodse geheel. Met, met heel veel vreugde um, en, en vriendschap en 
en alles wat erbij komt. In het vorige gebouw had je minder vrijheid en hier kan je alles doen wat je kan bedenken. Het oude gebouw is ook niet van onszelf. En hier heb je zoveel mogelijkheden. Het is echt geweldig. We really need a place so we can organize our own events and have really the, the community built stronger. De, de missie van Ben de Gamos moet ook ergens fysiek waargemaakt worden. Want zonder, zonder een plek help je alleen maar het idee. There are so many nice people and everybody. If you need help, you know that you can ask anyone. And I never felt that before in this show. Yeah, very exciting, right? Very exciting. So um, I'm happy to open the floor for questions. Thank you very much for your time. I'm just going to put in the um, charger and I'm, I'm with you. <laughs> yeah, I, I saw that the, the computer is uh, getting discharged. So thank you so much, everyone, for, for being here. We're going to now open up for questions. We're just waiting for Nakshan to return. Um, and as he said earlier, we're going to send out tomorrow a follow-up email where we will share uh, how you can be in touch with, with the Nakshan and the Bendigamos community, how um, you can learn about Amsterdam in general. We'll send out some uh, links of, of interest. And Nachshon, now that you're back, uh, I wanted to, before I get into the, the questions, um, there was something that we were discussing when we were preparing for this talk um, that you mentioned to us. And, and I just want you to say a couple of words that if people want to support you and help you, is there any way they can do that? Um, yes, of course. Um, yeah, so um, we uh, have, have several ways where you can support us. First of all, we just like... For you to to know what we're doing so if you like to subscribe to our newsletter or follow us on facebook or instagram you can and i will send the links for that we also have a patreon page where you can get updates in, uh, in exclusively in english even um but with the community center we still have some projects also that could use some help um so yeah, if you would like to support us in either yeah help helping us to to reach our potential with the building or with the programming for example or some certain projects or education that's all very welcome, and I'll definitely send you the, the links how to how to do that or how to contact me. And other than that, just you know, knowing that we exist, um, maybe visiting us, telling other people about us, is also very welcome. Or just to do something in your own community to strengthen Jewish life, because we are really just one global Jewish community as well, and we we, we just also really need to yeah to invest in the in the Jewish world. And if that happens, then this benefits all of us. Thank you. And I just want to say that there are a lot of comments in the chat congratulating you and, and feeling your enthusiasm and saying like how what a gift this is that, that you are doing this. I'm just going to read one, which is also a question. Um, this is such a high bar for um, for congregations around the world to model themselves after. May I ask where all, all these ideas came from? Uh, what sources and persons were they inspired by? Thank you. Um, thank you for the question. Um, and I understand it may feel like a bit much. Um, on the other hand, even if you take one or two ideas and, you know, that can already make a change. Um, but I'm happy to help people uh, in our com communities to think like how they can implement this in a way that's not so um, so important. Uh, uh, sorry, not so difficult because, as I said, we're just working with volunteers and I'm doing this on the side of all the other things I'm doing. So it's not that it's also a mindset. Most of the ideas came from me being in a Jewish environment for a really long time and just seeing all the things that went wrong for such a long time and basically just doing the opposite now, <laughs> doing the opposite of what I saw um, happen. So, and um, I, have, I, mean, I have a flexible, flexible brain. I like to think in solutions and this means really a lot to me. So when I, when I see something that's not working, I just automatically think, okay, so how could we solve this? And then that's also what I do for my work. And uh, I'm also happy to do that for our community and also for other communities in the in the world. Um, that being said, I, I do have some inspirations. Um, the idea about entry points was something that I I sort of knew, but this is what I got from Rabbi Mervis, the, the chief rabbi of UK, for example. Um, the innovation thing I got from Rabbi Lopez Cardozo. And so there are some ideas here and there that I try to to distract uh, things from. Um, 
but also really being in a community for a really long time and seeing things go wrong all the time <laughs> and just being sad about it. And, uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, Gabriel, go ahead. Hi, first, and I'll be quick in respect of time for everybody. Uh, congratulations, Masalto. It seems you're doing an amazing job. Uh, yes, I have two questions. Uh, the Is the community affiliated like to reform or conservative, or is it just kind of open? And the, another direct question is like, have you had any conflicts or direct criticism by the Orthodox uh, establishment? Because I know they sometimes don't agree with a very open door of policy. Yes. So I will tell you this first. Um, I studied political science and it's really been a blessing in, in this environment because it's a very political environment and you have to be very diplomatic um, and understand, you know, uh, social sciences and, and other things. So that's been very helpful. Um, I'm very aware of the different interests of the communities and we try to to yeah to actively make a strategy on how to do things what not to do what to do we we know where the, where we have where the space is where the gray area is and sometimes we proactively speak to the other communities before we do something like for example our affiliation with london we can just do that if you do that we, you have a war so we first ask for permission and we discuss our plans with the current that with the local revenants and these things really help um Generally, we don't have fights. There, we have had one or two events where something happened that people didn't like so much, but they can just t tell me, and then we'll just listen to them, which really helps if you if people feel like you're not trying to, um, you know, we're not a threat. We're not actively a threat to anyone. We're trying just to be positive and constructive, and that helps a lot to not take things too personal or not to escalate if not necessary. Our synagogue, our services are orthodox meaning the services are according to the old traditions of the Portuguese synagogue. The food is kosher. Inside, we keep the Shabbat. But the atmosphere is very informal, very open. And that's for the service part and the religious part. However, we have cultural things and things with our Jewish organizations where it's more inclusive and more open. So it depends a bit on what we're doing. Our main goal is just to grow Jewish life. For the synagogue services, we want to keep a certain, uh, yeah, a certain, um, le yeah, let's say the traditions of the Portuguese community. We just don't want them to disappear. But on a general level, we just want to grow Jewish life. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, there was a question. How do you sustain all this financially? Okay. So um, until before we start, we um, we got the our own building. As I said, we got our funding from uh, the friends that we have. They, they all each pay like a few euros a month. We have um, subsidies from some Jewish foundations and we have some sponsors that, um, um, yeah, some sponsors that, um, that give us some larger amounts and together we, we break even um, because we don't have that much um, costs. We have the rent, we have foods, and um, security, and because of, we are all volunteers, so all the other things are for free. I can lead the services. We have a committee, Kiddush committee, that takes care of the food. Um, children's services, they have a small, uh, a small amount, and we make sure that all the events are sort of um, not so expensive. Um, however, now that we have our own building, we are we have uh, very large debts. <laughs> we um, so we do have to work on still um still finding finances to make sure that we can actually keep the building and, and make sure the financing is healthy but once the building is taken care of again we will be able to break even uh easily with uh, because we don't have that many costs thank you um there was a question if you do conversion programs okay so one of the um political things is that there are um, territoriums, territories, right? And the Orthodox um, rabbis in the Netherlands, the revenants, they have a few things that they are really adamant about to for them to have control over it for logical reasons, which is uh, kashrut and um, and also giur. 
and uh, so conversion. And we have said that when we affiliate to an outside, an, a Bedin, an, a rabbinical court from a different country, that we will not um, deal with that areas um, because we, we thought that if we would, that would create a lot of havoc, that would create a lot of uh, tension. So we've said we won't do it yet. Maybe in five to 10 years when we are bigger um, and we are even more established, um, they can really go around us will try to renegotiate. But for now, most important is to get those 85% of the people in first. And uh, that's really our main goal. And it's a lot of work and we have to, we don't have any time to lose. Because if you if you do the calculations, we have in the Netherlands about 20 chupot a year, if you're lucky. That means that in 50 years from now, if the, the numbers actually keep like this, we have 1000 married couples. Over fifty, like fifty years of married couples, one thousand married couples. Um, that's nothing. It's not even if that's your community, one thousand married couples. You don't have a school, you don't have the schools like we have now. You don't have the restaurants. You don't have the synagogues. So, and with eighty-five percent in the marriage rate, it means basically every day one person of every of the age group that's marrying um is lost. Every day we 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 are losing one person. Um. So we have no time to lose. We have to act now. And uh, conversion is important. Um, I think there's a lot of things to be improved there, but it's okay for now that we that we're not working on it. We have to- Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Do you receive any support from any Dutch non-Jewish organizations? Some. Over the past year, we have, um, because we need to, to finance our buildings, we have, uh, what's the word like? Um, we have contacted more uh, some of the Christian organizations. Um, we have, for example, Christians for Israel, and we've been giving. I've been giving some lectures there, um, and we've we've been getting some donations from there. However, we make sure that these are from Christian organizations that do not have the intention to convert us. But we have plenty of them in the Netherlands. It's not huge amounts, but we are increasingly getting some support from them. Um, also in our struggles with the anti-Semitism in the city going on. So um, th I think it's important to to have them also as allies and to make more use of it, especially because we're such a small minority in the in this country. So we need to we need to, to make use of the allies. Thank you. Um, checking if there are more. Um, what is the security situation of the of the congregation? So actually, the situation has not factually not changed so much, um, even since before October seven. Basically, everything we do, our schools are uh, even if we have like a barbecue with twenty people, when we have an event, we have security. The schools are secured. Um, we have people with weapons from the from the state standing in 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 front of the more busy parts. That's unfortunately how it is. Um, however, after October 7th, I must say that the the locations that we, where we can be free, where we can be ourselves, where we don't have to hide our symbols and our personality, our, our heritage, our, like our being Jewish, um, have become smaller because there has been more protests on the streets and in the train stations, in the colleges and universities, um, high schools. So that's been quite problematic that's, that we have, uh, we're confined to smaller spaces where we can be ourselves. Um, people feel more scared also, and they have good reasons to. They're, um, but factually for our synagogue, not much has happened, except for that people are more scared and we have to, uh, yeah, we're even in even smaller uh, bubbles where we can feel safe and people feel less um, perspective on how this is going to be in, in a few years from now because the local government doesn't seem like they are uh, capable of fixing this problem. However, I think it even makes it more more important for us to invest in our future and making sure that we can take care of ourselves. And we we really need everyone because our our situation would look very differently if all those 50,000 shoes that we have are affiliated in some way that would make such a huge difference. It's Thank not, you. It's Thank out. you so much. Yeah. Uh, so now I, I I more or less try to cover most of the questions. Again, there are many, many comments, and I want to let everyone know that, that tomorrow you will receive 
all the information, also how you can support the Bendigamos community and also how to get in touch and how to visit them uh, and, and also to learn a bit more in general uh, about this community. So you will, you will receive all this information, including this uh, recording of today's um, talk. And Nachshon, I just want to encourage you to, to read the, all the comments that you're receiving because it looks like that you really inspired people and 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 it's really it was really amazing to to hear you speak about your community um so we will close for today and and we want to thank uh, all of you for for joining us today and if there are further questions of course you can reach out to us or to to Nachshon please, do. His, please uh, do yes contact information tomorrow <laughs> thank you everyone and Nachshon, you're welcome to share some closing wisdom with us as, as uh, part of your talk. <laughs> uh, closing wisdom. I, I just want to really want to thank you um, for your attention and for your for questions and for your support. Um, I For me, this is really the most important thing in my life. I decided this is what I want to spend my time on, on the Jewish community. And I just really hope that, yeah, you're, you're, um, this inspires you even a little bit to, to either do more for a community here or for your community where you are, because um, that's, I think that's what, what all of us personally need and what the world needs. What the world needs is a stronger Jewish community. So I really hope that this helps us as a global Jewish, no, our Jewish people to be stronger. And uh, I hope that uh, maybe in, in one or two years from now, we'll have a, a new meeting and we can say that the world is a better place for, for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Nachshon, and thank you, everyone, and we wish you a wonderful rest of the day or, or good evening or good night, yes. <laughs> and we hope to see you all soon. Thank you. Bye, everyone.